Anyway, so without further ado, maybe Stephen Rapp, who is the third chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, will tell us about his court and his achievements and the challenges that lie ahead for him. Well, thank you very much, uh, Layla. As she indicated, I'm the third prosecutor, David Crane, who you know so well, was the first, and, and Desmond Silva, now at night, uh, knighted by Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> Sir Desmond uh, was the second prosecutor. Uh, I came to this post appointed by Secretary General Hannon in uh, the UN in December of 2006 after working uh, almost six years at the Rwanda Tribunal, a uh, person prosecuting the immediate trial that Hudson General mentioned uh, uh, in trial, uh, and also working in, in other trials, appearing and cross examining and examining witnesses and preparing uh, other trials under the supervision of a prosecutor challenge. Uh, the Special Court for Sierra Leone uh, is, is different, as, as Leah has, has highlighted. Uh, it has, uh, first of all, a more limited mandate than the other courts. Uh, you've heard the others refer to prosecution of those responsible uh, for genocide and other violations of international humanitarian law. Uh, our uh, mandate is to prosecute those bearing the greatest responsibility for violations of humanitarian law, but like the other courts uh, within a territory, in our case in Sierra Leone, and within a temporal period uh, from, from basically uh, November of 1996 until uh, January of uh, 2002. The uh, court uh, is, is a hybrid institution uh, in the sense that the majority of the judges are appointed by the United Nations, a minority uh, by the President of Sierra Leone. I'm appointed by the Secretary General, my deputy uh, prosecutor is appointed by the President of, of the country. 60% uh, of the people working in the court are employees, uh, are, as employees or as detailees, are Sierra Leone citizens. And uh, I think it has made our institution much closer to the crime, much closer to the victim. And, and I think this has aided us in, in having an impact, albeit uh, our mandate is, is, of course, a very limited one. They Crane made the initial decision to, to indict to, uh, 13 individuals, and, and that has been the full list of indictees uh, of the court. Uh, there have been no guilty pleas. Uh, three big trials that have gone forth in, in Freetown, and now a trial of enormous international significance uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the Hague. The, uh, let me just briefly mention the, the, the Taylor case, and I was interested in what Omar Ishmael said this morning, I, I so much agreed with him, he was talking about uh, how there would come a day when witnesses uh, would appear and, and testify against the President of Sudan and Omar Bashir in court. And I think many people in the world right now say, well, how could, how could that ever happen? And that's, that's, a, that's a fight for me. And uh, I only have to take you back five years ago when David Crane uh, initially uh, with a sealed indictment, but actually a public indictment, uh, indicted uh, Charles Taylor. Uh, he was president of, uh, of uh, Liberia, the same way that when Louise Arp obtained the, the indictment against uh, Slobodan Milosevic, uh, he was uh, president of, uh, of uh, then the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Uh, when the earlier indictment came down against Karadzic, he was president of the, of the Bosnian Republic, essentially. Uh, those, those individuals were never expected uh, to be brought in, into custody, and, and they were. Uh, particularly in Taylor's case, in, in August of 2003, in a, in a classic negotiations of putting peace ahead of justice, or apparent peace ahead of justice, Taylor was allowed to, uh, to go into a safe and, and comfortable exile in, in Nigeria. And at that point, I think uh, no one thought that, uh, that he would ever uh, come to, to justice. But yet, uh, in barely two and a half years, and I was missing the fact that I wasn't there on the afternoon of March of 2006, when at 7 p.m. at night, as the sun was setting over the Atlantic, uh, which the court is very near, and the free town, uh, uh, one of those old Russian helicopters that we use in UN missions uh, uh, came through the clouds. So uh, about thousands, indeed tens of thousands of Syria, I mean, stood on the rooftops and watched uh, Charles Taylor delivered to justice uh, to the detention center of a special court for Sierra Leone, uh, a reflection of an intense effort in, uh, on the part of, of the court and of the international community, uh, an amazing number of, of, of things that had to be done that were done uh, that made possible uh, that, that, that moment. And of course, for those of us who are prosecutors, uh, that is very much only the beginning. 
and now we're continuing with that work uh, with, with the trial of Charles Taylor in the Hague, uh, trying hard to learn the lessons that have been learned by the tribunals over the course of the last 15 years. Uh, we know we don't have four years of trying. We know there's great criticism about these institutions of taking too long and, and, and casting the, uh, the evidence uh, meant to, to broadly. Uh, we're committed to basically putting all of the evidence in, in that case in about 18 months. Uh, we're well into it. So we're now in the sixth month for the presentation of evidence. So today in the Hague, you know, it's uh, already had adjournment today. Uh, we had the 36th uh, prosecution witness uh, in the box uh, testifying against, uh, against Charles Taylor. We're hopeful to be able to complete that, the prosecution evidence. Uh, uh, the judges recently are going to require us to call a few more witnesses uh, on the crime base, but uh, uh, we're confident that in less than six months from now, uh, we'll have concluded the prosecution evidence and the defense has indicated they'll be presenting about four months of evidence. So by mid-2009, uh, we'll have a finalization of, of the trial, and, and certainly by the end of 2009, a judgment uh, on a case of, of immense complexity and importance. Uh, uh, everyone, of course, who followed the history of West Africa and read the news, uh, you know, notice about the alleged crimes of, of Charles Taylor. And of course, a lot of them involve crimes against his own people in Liberia. And we're not trying for those crimes. We're trying for what we believe he was responsible for in Mexico and showing the linkage between him, the responsibility, individual criminal responsibility for him, by him, uh, for murder, for rape, for amputation, for acts that, that were really part of the campaign of terror against the civilian population, uh, that included as well uh, crimes of, uh, of, uh, of the recruitment and, and uh, use and hostilities of, of children, enslavement to people for, uh, for forced labor, for the big dimes, Additionally, uh, uh, crimes such as uh, such as pillage, and of course, sexual crimes, an enormous part of, of the conflict, uh, rape. Uh, indeed, it's estimated that up to one third of the women in the war zones, uh, hundreds of thousands of women raped, uh, tens of thousands of women turned into sexual slaves or bushwives, uh, holding him responsible for those crimes when he never set foot in Sierra Leone. Uh, is is the immense challenge of the case. Uh, but our evidence is that, that indeed uh, he was the responsible, the person bearing the greatest responsibility for what those individuals were doing. And we'll talk later about the legal theories, about joint criminal enterprise, about accomplice liability, about the other ways in which uh, superior responsibility, other ways in which individuals like Mr. Taylor could be held uh, responsible. But each day we're presenting evidence which, is, which as Mark said, is, is a matter of articulating that experience and, and context of the law and the rules of uh, procedure. And, and most of the evidence that we presented today uh, has been that of insiders, people close to Taylor, uh, you know, in terms of the, the hierarchy, uh, the closest the person whose testimony I read in May was uh, Taylor's own vice president for three years, is, before that as ambassador to Libya, before that as inspector general of, the, uh, of his rebel movement, before that with him in the camps in Libya in 1989. But then finally his successor in August of, of 2003 in a move that shocked everyone in Liberia who appeared as a witness uh, against Charles Taylor and testified for seven days in May of, of, of this year. Uh, but others have involved his, his key executioners, those who killed and sometimes cannibalized uh, people who he selected for killing, and, uh, and people involved in the communication of orders, the delivery of diamonds, the delivery of material, training, safe havens, and everything else. Uh, obviously, a great many individuals who themselves have blood on their hands as, as one has to deal with those issues in any kind of uh, prosecutions of organized criminal activity. We sometimes need the John the Bull Gravano uh, to bring down John Gaddick. You have to define the persons inside the organization who may have very, very strange motivations, uh, but uh, and, and their testimony may need to be intensely corroborated uh, but without that kind of testimony, uh, you can't bring down the leader, particularly that leader is the president next door, not someone bearing a direct command responsibility for forces in, in the theater of the war. That's the Taylor trial of the legacy uh, on Sierra Leone, and I think we're well on the way to doing it. Thank you. Thank you so much.